Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith that comes down to us from Jesus and the apostles over 2,000 years. We want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, and to be passionate about it, and even to defend it. And even for non-Catholics, we have a large non-Catholic audience. We want to help you to know what the Catholic Church teaches and why. And sometimes on our show, we have guests who are experts in their fields, or who have written a book, or who have an incredible journey in some way. And today, we would uh, like to invite uh, Joe Heschmeyer. Is that how you say it, Joe? It is. Yeah, we'd like to invite you onto the show, and we're, we're very thankful that you've come onto the show. If people don't know Joe, he's a staff apologist for Catholic Answers, and he is actually a lecturer. He's a speaker, a blogger, podcaster, and he actually has written three books, including the one we're going to be talking about today, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church. Now, that's a bold claim, you know, because people say the early church wasn't Catholic. Catholics were invented by Constantine 300 years later, blended pagan and Christianity, and the result was the Catholic Church. And, you know, you're you're pretty sure in your book that the early church was Catholic, and you go through uh, a lot of the quotes, and you go through a lot of um, the early fathers, you let them speak for themselves. And so um, I appreciate this book, which I'll talk about more in a minute. But first, I just want to say thank you for coming on our show. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, for uh, our audience, this is not your typical uh, early church Catholic, was Catholic. This is not your typical early church fathers book. Most things, books that are written just say, oh, early church fathers, here's what they say. I like this book uh, because not only does it go through the early church fathers and definitely show that the early church was Catholic, but he also answers objections because not everybody believes the early church was Catholic. And so you go through objections and you, you know, you say, well, this is what the typical Protestant would say. And he quotes Protestant scholars, not just some Joe Schmoes, you know, Protestant. He taught, you know, it's like James White and some of the top Protestants out there to see what they say and why their arguments really don't hold up. So it's a great apologetics work. And I actually uh, think it's a really good book. So thank you for writing that, Joe. Well, oh, thank you very much. You know, I'm, I'm glad you highlighted that dimension. I find when I'm reading a book, uh, particularly in an area that I don't know a lot about, I'm often uh, initially persuaded by whatever a good author says, but then I'll have that lingering doubt in the back of my head where I know that if I read the opposite thing, you know, like if I'm reading about string theory or something like that, I read like Brian Greene, it's like, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. And then you read like not even wrong. And you're like, okay, they totally disagree. And that makes a lot of sense too. I just have no idea what to make of the kind of competing claims. And I anticipate there are people that's going to be their experience with the church fathers where one person says, they're Catholic and here's why. One person says, no, they weren't and here's why. And and someone standing back is just, okay, I don't know what to do with all of this evidence. So I've tried to engage and compare and do that weighing for people by taking what I view as some of the best kind of Protestant answers and objections and then showing kind of what to make of them and why they maybe don't work as well as they seem to. Yeah, no, that's fair. I think that's a good uh, summary. Uh, a lot of people you know, def a lot of Protestants definitely haven't read the fathers for themselves. A lot of Catholics haven't either. And uh, maybe you can just start by giving a brief overview of who are the early church fathers. Um, you know, why are they important to us today? <laughs> yeah. So other than I think on the cover of the book, I actually usually avoid using the phrase church fathers because there's a little bit of debate about what makes someone a father. You know, do you include people like Origen and Tertullian who aren't canonized? but are really influential theologians? Or do you include, you know, like what are the kind of boundaries? So I usually just say the early Christians or, you know, but we're really looking at early Christian theologians and especially the ones that were particularly influential in the life of the church. Um, the, you know, the ones who other people copied their work or maybe responded to it or built upon it, translated it in other languages. Those are really good indications that a work was influential. In the same way that, you know, I've, I was thinking about this this morning, when you see something like 750,000 copies sold underneath a book, that's a way of telling you, like, this is a book taken seriously by someone, maybe by the public, maybe by experts in the field, whatever it is, you know, that sort of thing. We've got all sorts of little cues that we can pick up on that it doesn't just seem to be, as you said, some Joe Schmo. Um, so given all of that, when, when I'm looking at the book, I'm looking specifically up to around the year 200. So what were the Christian theologians saying until about the year 200? So this is going to be the age of the apostles. And then the students of the apostles, people like Polycarp, who lives until about 155, well, who lives to 155. We, we know his date, death date almost exactly. 
uh, and and then Irenaeus, the next generation after him, you know, the people who so either the apostles, their students, and their students. So you're still extremely close to the time of the apostles. Someone like Irenaeus can say, I learned Christianity from Polycarp, who learned it from the Apostle John. That's a really compelling kind of thing that you know we can't say today. So what what did Christianity look like during the days of Irenaeus, of Polycarp, and of the apostles? Yeah, so you're talking really, you're reading the earliest Christian writings that we have as soon as the book of Acts, in a sense, ends. You know, I feel like a lot of Protestants, you know, take the book of Acts and they said, that's all we need. This is the history. If it's not in here, then it's not true. But, you know, there is, the church did continue after the book of Acts and the people in the book of Acts passed on that faith to other people. And so I feel like they sometimes overlook that. Um, would you agree with that? I, not only would I agree with that, I, one of the things I say in the book is like, if you go from the time of the apostles until the Reformation, you're skipping literally three quarters of the church's history. You're skipping three quarters of Christian history, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and so it'd be like trying to understand America by beginning with the election of John F. Kennedy, three quarters of the way through American <laughs> history. Like, that's just not going to get you a good sense of what's going on. Or if you start watching a movie three quarters of the way through, you're probably not going to understand the movie very well. Like there's going to be some things you get, but there's going to be a lot of other things where the significance is just lost on you. And that's what we find in Protestantism. Without that sense of history, without any greater depth than 500 years, uh, there's, I mean, I, I lived in Rome and a fair number of the churches there were older than Protestantism. And, you know, that's just to be like, if, if your religion is younger than the building in which our religion is practicing, like that's a big red flag. You're maybe not in a position to judge the whole Christian story because you just don't know it. Yeah. And so I'd encourage, and I'd encourage both Catholic and Protestants, and really anyone listening, if you're going to critique what's going on, read about it first, learn about it first, like find out what's going on first, and then you're in a better position to accept or reject it. Yeah, good points, good points. And I feel like a lot of, um, well, not just Protestants, but Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, many people outside the Catholic Church all seem to think that the Catholic, the early church, the earliest Christians we're talking about here were not Catholic. In fact, they would assert that it was the Catholic Church who corrupted the pure, pristine teachings of Jesus Christ that came down to us through the Bible, through the apostles, through the book of Acts, and even into the early church. Maybe the early church after the book of Acts was pure and pristine, but it was the Catholic Church who, who corrupted this. I mean, uh, what, what would you say about that? Yeah, this is one of the reasons I'm looking so early on. You you alluded to Constantine earlier. So you'll find different, you know, different people tell different stories. And it's not just Protestants, as you said, it's Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. It's plenty of non-religious people. Think about like Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code, where there tends to be a basic story. And the story is, A, uh, Jesus teaches this great thing and just happens to agree with what I already believed. And then B, uh, there's some process, somebody, Constantine or St. Augustine, or somebody changes the teaching and see the end result is the Catholic Church. And we can debate A on the level of theology, but B is a historical claim that somebody came in and changed the teachings of the church. Let's find out if that's true. And what this book shows, I think, repeatedly is it's not that these claims about, you know, uh, to, I'll give you an example I don't use in the book, but that I think speaks to one of the popular ones. Seventh-day Adventists will regularly claim, because Ellen Gold White says this explicitly, that Constantine changed the Christian day of worship from Saturday to Sunday in the 300s. But we have plenty of writings, like Justin Martyr in the 100s, explaining why it is Christians worship on Sunday and why they consider that the Lord's Day. And then you go back to the book of Revelation, you can find the Apostle John talking about worshiping on the Lord's Day, being caught up in the spirit on the Lord's Day. And so it's like, oh, wow. So not only did that not happen in the 300s, it didn't even happen in the 100s. This happened during the time of the Apostles. But once you trace it that far back, uh, you're in a situation where, you know, so you mentioned Mormons, they're going to say, well, the Apostles set this up, but then the priesthood dies out with them. At a certain point, if you say, the apostles failed to make any effective converts. Like they failed to make any converts they could pass the faith along to. And all of the people they tried to reach ended up just becoming heretics instead. Then you're indicting their ability to preach. You're indicting their ability to teach. You're indicting their ability to do the thing they were sent to do. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. And according to all of the apostasy theories, the apostles just don't do that. So the apostles fail. The apostles uh, don't do the thing they were sent to do, 
despite trying to. Well, that calls into question the whole Christian claim. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example from the book of Acts. Uh, Gamaliel gets up and he says, look, this Christian movement, if it's not of God, is going to die out. And if it is of God, it won't die out. And if you oppose it, you may be opposing God. And so that's a really good litmus test. Uh, Protestants, Mormons, Adventists, anyone saying that the apostolic church died out is saying it wasn't of God. They're saying this was not a thing founded by God, according to the test laid out in scripture. Uh, that kind of apostasy theory is just incompatible with Christian belief. And yet it's the one people are just assuming. And, and remarkably, as you kind of alluded to, they're assuming it without actually knowing the names of any of the people they're accusing of heresy and apostasy, without knowing anything about the actual history. They're just vaguely discrediting Christians of the first, second, and third centuries uh, just out of their own sheer ignorance and in, in historical and theological miseducation. Well said. So, you know, I think Protestants have heard for a long time and so many Protestants, so many from the highest levels of the Protestant faith, heads of seminaries, scholars, bishops have converted to the Catholic Church when they discovered the earliest Christians. And in fact, they were Catholic. And this has been happening for decades. And in fact, it's a problem for the Protestant religions, you know, who want to keep their members. And so I've noticed a, a shift in the Protestant religions, well, at least with scholars like James. I use that word loosely with like James White, um, who are trying to usurp now. It's a new technique they're doing. They're trying to make the early church, the earliest Christians, Protestant. They're saying that Augustine was Protestant and Jerome was a Protestant and all the, uh, yeah, we believe that the early church was great and they had great things to say, but they were in fact Protestant and taught uh, Protestant doctrines. But you're pretty clear in your book that in fact they were Catholic, right? I mean, what do you have to say about that? Yeah. um, So we can talk about the specifics. We can talk about the general. On the level of the specifics, let's take someone like Jerome. He would not... uh... (laughs) <laughs> he would not comfortably be a Lutheran or a Calvinist. He, uh, he says we ought to remain in that church, which was founded by the apostles and continues to this day. If you ever hear of any that are called Christians taking their name, not from the Lord Jesus Christ, but from some other, for instance, Marcionites, Valencians, men of the mountain or the plain, we could add to this list, Lutherans and Calvinists. You may be sure that you have there, not the church of Christ, but the synagogue of Antichrist. Uh, I, I wouldn't actually go as far as he goes to call Protestants, you know, members of the synagogue of the Antichrist. But his point is, if we can trace your religion back to some time later than the apostles, and you can't show an unbroken lineage, you're not the Christian church. You're something else. Uh, and he goes on from there and says, for the fact that they took their rise after the foundation of the church is proof that they are those whose coming the apostle foretold. Now, what's he talking about there? Well, the Apostle Paul, and actually we get this in St. Peter, we get this in plenty of other places, warn against those coming who are going to introduce false teaching. So in other words, if someone says, here I am with these new teachings to go back to what the early Christians taught and it got lost, that's a big red flag because Scripture warns us about that person. That, you know, our job is to contend for the faith delivered once for all to the apostles, as it says in the epistle to Jude, or of Jude. Uh, That... We're not here to invent some new teaching. We're not here to rediscover some allegedly lost teaching. We're here to believe what was always believed. So when we see that the Protestant reformers and the Adventists and the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and fill in the blank, believe things that weren't believed by Christians down through the ages, that's enough to know from a Christian perspective those aren't the true teachings. That some new teaching has been introduced. It's contrary to what was taught. It's not compatible, you know. And and so that's looking at Jerome specifically. We could do the same thing with Augustine. Um, But we could also just say, look, these guys were high-ranking clergy in the Catholic Church in the early days. They were bishops, and in the case of Jerome, priest. uh, And they were part of an institution uh, where they were offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass every week, even every day. They believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but not just that they believed in the real presence in some, they believed the Eucharist was Jesus and should be worshipped. They offered that worship. They offered the sacrifice of Jesus to the Father. They believed that you were saved through baptism. Their writings abound in all this stuff. They wouldn't comfortably be able to go to James White Church, partly because they don't think his church is a church. 
that they, they wouldn't recognize it as a church. Ignatius of Antioch says, if you don't have a bishop, presbyters, and deacons, you don't have a church. That's 107. So <laughs> it's not like, oh, some late reform. No, no, no. You just aren't a church. You're like, whatever you are, a nice Bible study, a synagogue of the Antichrist, something in between, you're not a church. That's what the early Christians have to say. Now, you might accept that or reject it. But to pretend that they were Protestants is just a total bastardization of what they actually believed and what they actually said. Yeah, and I think that's a very interesting. And, you know, this goes to the continuity of belief. I think it's important. I think this is what Protestants discover when they look at the early church. You know, the the claim that Constantine started the Catholic Church and then started, you know, the belief of baptismal regeneration, the true presence of the Eucharist or the papal papal authority, you know, that sort of thing, primacy of the Bishop of Rome. When in fact, before the year 300, you can see all of these things in all of the writings that you're talking about. And in this uh, podcast today, people, we're going to be talking about some of these shortly. We're going to be talking about baptismal regeneration, true presence of the Eucharist, what the early church looked like. And we're going to see how all of the earliest Christians were in fact Catholic and teach Catholic things that we teach today all the way back to the time of Christ. Um, but before we get to those real quick, uh, how would you respond to somebody who says, you know, well, who cares about the early church fathers? Okay, maybe they were Catholic, but who cares? You know, I go by the Bible. Uh, Ignatius isn't infallible. Justin Martyr is not infallible. Only the word of God is infallible. How would you, how would you answer that? Yeah, I think there's two, two answers to that. One is the infallibility question. Because you've got people who don't go to a full who cares, but can just say like, oh, well, you know, maybe they were overall good men, but they make some mistakes and the Bible doesn't. So I'm going to trust the Bible where they disagree. I understand that position, honestly. And uh, in in one way, that position is true. You know, if if you find a particular teaching of a particular church father that doesn't square with what scripture teaches, they could have misread it. They could have misunderstood it. In the book, I, I highlight two things. Uh, one, the distinction between the church fathers as theologians and the church fathers as eyewitnesses. For an example of the church fathers acting as theologians, you've got St. Augustine when he is, I'm looking down the road, but this is just to take an, an example that's kind of famous, when he's unpacking uh, St. Paul's letter to the Romans. And he says, I don't know for sure what this means. I'm going to pray about it and hopefully give the right answer. I'm paraphrasing. He's working as a theologian there. He's trying to unpack scriptural data. He doesn't claim to have any special insight. He doesn't claim the apostles taught this is what Paul meant or, you know, this is what the church has always believed Paul meant. No, he just is saying as a theologian, this is what I understand to be going on there. And that, that could be great. That could be erroneous. There's no special protection there. On the other hand, you have uh, the church fathers when they say, here is what we were taught by the apostles. And especially when you're going back to the 100s, where they actually knew the apostles or were in communities with people who knew the apostles, that claim is pretty credible. And then you're not attacking the theological acumen of a particular church father. You're attacking like what an apostle apparently taught them. You see what I mean? In the same way that if take like a courtroom analogy, there's a difference between the expert who says, here's my best reconstruction of what probably happened at the crime scene. And the person who says, well, I saw this, or you know, the suspect confessed to me that they did this. That's a different kind of evidence. Where now it's okay. Well, if you're saying you heard this from the apostles, you're either outright lying, or the apostles really taught it. It's not uh, some good faith error the way you could have with a theologian, where despite their best effort, theologians disagree sometimes. No, nobody's being deceptive. Nobody's being sneaky. They just read the evidence differently. Well, when in the eyewitness, you're in a different kind of evidence. So I, I, I'm highlighting that. The second thing is that when we're looking at the church fathers, on the issues we're looking at, it's not one or two people. It's unanimity. It's everyone we know of believes the same thing about baptism. Everyone we know of believes the same thing about the Eucharist. Everyone we know of believes the same things about bishops, uh, believes that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospels. So there you can't say, well you know, Pobody's nerfing. Like somebody maybe made a mistake. Because if you're going to say everyone misunderstood this basic element of Christianity, you're no longer attacking one Christian making a mistake. You're now attacking how reliably did the apostles and their successors teach Christianity. And so then you're back into apostasy territory. And, and I already explained why that, that doesn't work. Okay, that's the first kind of answer. The other answer is to say, well, where do you get the Bible from? If someone who says, I don't need the church fathers, I'm just going to go with the Bible. 
okay, well, how do you know which books belong in the Bible? How do you know? And, and so in the book, I have a specific chapter that looks at how do we know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four gospels and that there are no others? How do we know they're written by apostles? How do we know they're orthodox? How do we know, you know, and all of these questions require you to take the word of second century Christian. And if you're not willing to do that, you have no way of knowing when these documents were written. You have no way of knowing who they were written by. You have no way of knowing if those people were, were reliable witnesses, you know, all of those things. And so you're just left with no Bible. So the person who says, I'll take the Bible instead of the church, or I'll take the Bible instead of early Christianity, ends up left with neither the Bible nor early Christianity nor the church. They're, they're left with nothing. And, and that we see that even in the lifetime of Luther, right? Like Luther says, we don't need councils. We don't need popes. We can go with the Bible alone. And what does he do? He says, well, I don't believe these seven books of the Old Testament. I don't believe these four books of the New Testament. And early, you know, and then Protestants around him, their own list. Calvin says, I don't believe six of the seven books that Luther rejects out of the Old Testament, but he keeps Baruch. You know, it's it's this kind of insanity where the Bible immediately falls apart once people decide to go with the Bible alone, because the Bible doesn't have, you know, an inspired table of contents. And even if it had a table of contents, how do we know we could trust it? You have to look to the witness of the early church. You have to look to what the early Christians did. Yeah, all great points. And I like to tell people when I'm <clears throat> doing apologetics or, you know, talking to people about these things, like people will say, you know, I go by the Bible. You know, you have the fathers, that's fine. But I go by the Bible. It's the only word of God. I said, but here's the point you're missing. You're creating a false dichotomy. And the reality is that we are going by the Bible too. You right. are also, we're just disagreeing on what that Bible means. So we're going back to the earliest Christians to see how they understood the Bible, because it's not like we're going by them and they're going by nothing. They're going by what they heard from Jesus and the apostles and by the scriptures that they had, and they were the earliest sources. And so, you know, if there's a discrepancy about how to uh, interpret, say, something like John 6.55, or yes. John 3, 5, you know, you must be born First again. Peter 3, 21, baptism exactly. now saves. Does that mean baptism now saves you, or does that mean baptism is a symbol? I mean, it, it's, it's all over the place. You're right. Like, no one is just taking the text without interpretation. Everyone is saying these passages are to be understood. Literally, these ones are to be understood figuratively. The, you know, when he says this, he means this. When he says you must be born again of water and the spirit, is he talking about baptism? Is he talking about something else? interpretation is required. So the person who says, I'll go with the Bible alone, really means I trust that God is going to lead me and inspire me rather than leading and inspiring the body of Christ. The Only me. Yeah. And well, so Luther famously towards the end of his life uh, admitted that in his early days, he'd had a crisis of conscience and it took the form, are you alone wise? Because he realized he was rejecting the entirety of Christianity that came before him. And he should have listened to his conscience, and he didn't. And eventually yeah. it was deadened, and he became convinced he was alone once. And yeah. that, that kind of hubris it accounts for why Luther, in his later days, became a monster. Even like Protestants who know the story of Luther, like he becomes a virulent anti-Semite who wants to like kill rabbis and burn down synagogues. Like The man does not grow towards being a saint. He, he takes on this increasingly kind of monstrous turn, and even other Protestants, Phil Blankton and others, really kind of distance themselves from late Luther. Uh, that's, I would argue, the sin of pride. It's what happens to Lucifer, and it's what happens yeah. to any of us when we to say, like, no, God's going to lead me and guide me. I don't need anybody else. That's not what faith looks like, right? Like, go back to Acts 8. Uh, Philip encounters the Ethiopian eunuch reading Isaiah, says, do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch doesn't say, I don't need anybody. Isaiah uh, will just be revealed to me through divine inspiration. No, he says, how can I unless someone teaches me? And he invites Philip into the chariot and has to preach to him. That's humility. That's the mm -hmm. opposite of uh, the, certainly the reformers kind of approach, this I alone am wise sort of methodology. Yeah. And he learned directly from an apostle and then he could go teach that. And here's what, here's what Philip said. And then that exactly. person can pass that on. And so, so we're not saying it's, we're going by the Bible or church fathers. We're saying that the earliest Christians agreed with how we interpret the Bible today. They, we interpret it the same way because it's the same church. So let's get into some of these sure. um, in regard to uh, church structure and what the church is. Catholics and Protestants 
you know, vary quite drastically. Protestants vary quite drastically from high church to non-denominational to everything in between. So what did the earliest Christians uh, believe about this and what did they think the church was? Yeah, this is actually, this, this dovetails really nicely with the point that you were just making that, you know, you take someone like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, that this is a lived community, right? So another way to say that is when you look at the letters of the New Testament, especially the epistles, they're written to churches. One of the things that logically means is that these churches existed before the New Testament letters, that the oldest letters, the epistles, the oldest parts of the New Testament, rather, uh, are coming after the churches have already been built up. So the Protestant approach is to start with the letters, see what we can glean about the structure of the church from that, and then try to like reverse engineer a church. And that's totally ahistorical. That's totally not how early Christianity worked. They already had the churches, which already had a particular structure. And then those churches were being written too. And so you don't find, and then this is like one of the notable things about this is there's no passage saying, here's how to build a church because they're already there. You didn't need that part of the New Testament because the churches were already built up and structured. And this is actually the thing that's really maddening for modern Protestants, because as you said, there's a wide variety of reads about, well, what do we make of the biblical evidence? Because they'll talk about these ministries and these offices, and it's not always clear which ones are which. And, you know, (laughs) it's really kind of striking in that the, the sheer number of Protestant attempts to create, uh, like what the biblical model of the church looks like. In the book, I I point out that the Southern Baptist Convention has like a two-tier structure of pastors and deacons. Um, The Book of Church Order used by Presbyterians has like a different structure. The United Methodist Church has a different structure. Episcopalians and Anglicans have an even higher structure. Uh, John Calvin thought there were four orders to the church, pastors, doctors, elders, deacons. Nobody takes his view. Uh, So you have just like this crazy wide variety of of Protestant attempts to reverse engineer the church for the simple reason that those instructions were never left because the church was already there. And so you don't need someone saying, here's how to build the church. But nevertheless, uh, what can we say about that? Because the church is still reflected in scripture. You just don't have an instruction manual to get to the church. Uh, In the same way that you don't have an instruction manual for like how to call 12 apostles because Jesus had already done that. And so, you know, those things aren't going to be, they're not necessary. Uh, What we can say is that Ignatius of Antioch, who's one of the clearest witnesses, says you don't have a church unless you have bishops, presbyters, we now say priests, and deacons. I already alluded to that before. Uh, Clement, in the first letter of Clement from about 96, talks about the structure of the church being a thing that's received by the church, that Jesus teaches it to the apostles, apostles give it to us, and we preserve it today. Now, that's a really important kind of understanding because it means this. The early Christians did not feel free to reject the apostolic structure of the church in favor of a different structure. That they viewed their role as preserving what was handed on by the apostles. And even a lot of scholarship misses this fact. They'll claim, you know, uh, uh, scholars who reject the Catholicity and the Catholic structure of the early church will say there's an emerging monopiscopacy. What that means is that bishops slowly emerge. And the people who say this are just detached from reality. And and I say that, and I know that sounds like a very strong or maybe cruel thing to say. What I mean is simply this. This story they're telling is that the apostles either didn't care about the structure of the church enough to set up one single structure or that the original structures, for whatever reason, they were either disorganized or you had a panel of people who kind of co-ruled a local church. And that somewhere along the way, one guy takes the reins from everybody else. Uh, Think about, you know, like Caesar Augustus taking the reins and ending the Roman Republic or something like, you know, some similar thing happens. And yet this is all done without any documentary evidence. No one notices, hey, the apostles created this type of church, and then you just came along and usurped it and went with this totally different kind of church. Or we all took a vote and decided to switch the type. You know, there's nothing. These would be the kind of thing that would burn a lot of personal bridges, right? Like if you just went into your local church and said, I'm the boss now, people are going to care about that. They're going to write about that. You know, if, if tomorrow I went into a congregational church and said, I'm your pope, 
that's not just going to be something people say, oh, okay, and then to continue on to go shopping afterwards. No, no, no. There's going to be some conversation, some debate. You, We don't find anything of that. There's literally no evidence of that ever happening anywhere in the early church. There's just none. And that's all we take. Like We can look at the writings of Ignatius, and we can tell you who the bishop was in some of these early churches. For instance, in the Church of Smyrna, the bishop is Polycarp. He addresses him as the bishop by name. And there's plenty of other examples. We can tell you who the presbyters were, who the deacons were. So we have a tremendous amount of evidence for this three-tiered structure. And from Clement, we have this sense that the three-tiered structure of the church was inherited ultimately from Judaism. High priest, priest, Levite, prefigures, bishop, presbyter, deacon. That that whole like Christianity in fulfilling and inheriting this kind of Judaic structure was not just like, hey, do whatever, create a democracy, make a congregational church, make a presbyteral church. No, no, no. It's like, this is something we've received and we don't have permission to tinker with it. So that's the uh, that's the Christian claim in a nutshell. And that's a good claim. It kind of goes back <clears throat> to what you were saying that, you know, there's no evidence to the contrary for any of these things where the, the early church is well documented that there are bishops and priests and deacons and such. And I tell people that all the time. I, I ask Protestants, does your church have bishops, priests, or deacons? If not, how can you say it's the church since these offices were found in the Bible? You know, and it's like, I, I love what you said, you know, that if somebody somewhere along the line just decided to take control of it, even though Polycarp knew and learned from the apostle John. So if he was a bishop in the earliest century, I mean, I don't think it came about, but if it did, why isn't anybody writing about it or talking about it? So I think that's very, very interesting. Um, so well, actually, I if, like, I can, if I can build on that point, yeah, here, please imagine the situation which Polycarp is one of these usurpers of, of Episcopal authority. Why is his mentor, the apostle John silent about that? Whether he like publicly lambasts him or just privately says, that's not the structure we created. That's not the structure Jesus gave us. It, you, you've now basically called into question one of the apostles. Like Either John is negligent at best or complicit in this evil at worst, or he's approving and said, oh, I guess we should have had bishops the whole time. But none of those stories are going to be good for Protestants. None of them make uh, any sense of the Protestant claim. And we know that Clement, the fourth pope, you know, around, you know, between 70 and 90 AD was correcting people, not in his realm, you know, farther right. away. So we know people were correcting things that were out of alignment than what the apostles taught. So if this yes. is what, so not the idea what he correct his own student is, is a pretty shocking kind of. Exactly. Um, so why don't we move on to something that's a very, um, it, it can get a little bit feisty sometimes, you know, because Protestants and Catholics, you know, disagree. And I shouldn't even say disagree because Protestants disagree with Protestants on this. And that's baptismal regeneration. Um, <clears throat> you know, Catholics think that, you know, we are regenerated through baptism. Baptism saves us. Christ saves us through baptism. And, you know, we become, we receive new life through baptism. And, you know, many Protestants uh, believe that too, but most the majority of Protestants do not. Um, but, you know, again, he said, he, she said, this church says this, this church says, what did the earliest Christians think? The people who knew the apostles, what did they think? Yeah. Uh, in the book, I quote Everett Ferguson, who he wrote uh, looking at the first five centuries. He has a book called Baptism in the Early Church, History, Theology, and Liturgy in the First Five Centuries. And it's, he goes through this for hundreds of pages. So I'm going to tell you this, and you can either read the chapter of my book or read his book if you want more of the documentary evidence for this. They were all Catholic. Like they, they all believed that to be born again is to be born again of water and the spirit and the waters of baptism. That when scripture speaks of the laver of regeneration or the washing of rebirth, that's about baptism. When St. Peter says baptism now saves you, he actually meant to say baptism now saves you and not something else. Uh, that all of these things, and, and in fact, they unpack not just the kind of obvious passages like that, but a bunch of other ones. So, um, I, I look at Cyprian. I'm, I'm cheating there a little bit because he's actually a little later than 200. Um, he's from the 200s. But nevertheless, I, I like his uh, exegesis of Ezekiel, where he looks at Ezekiel 36, when God promises to take us from the nations, gather us from all the countries, and bring you into your own land. That is the incorporation of the Gentiles. And then says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your uncleanlinesses. And shall, from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Okay, so in baptism, we are washed clean. We're freed from all of our sins. A new heart I will give you. That's regeneration. A new spirit I will put within you. 
I'll take out of your flesh the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you. You may receive the Holy Spirit in baptism and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. You shall dwell in the land which I gave to your fathers, and you should be my people, and I will be your God. So it's the entrance into the people of God, the entrance into the church. Now, we see that throughout the New Testament, and we see that throughout the early Christians. You know, uh, Ananias says to St. Paul after his conversion, now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon his name. That's Acts 22, 16. Uh, so all of those things, you know, when the people hearing St. Peter's Pentecost sermon ask what to do, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So all of that's pretty clear. Uh, they we're told we can't enter the kingdom of God unless one is born of water and the Spirit. Jesus says that in John 3, verse 5. And, and likewise, when the people who hear the Pentecost homily are baptized, we're told that those were added to the church, 3,000 souls. So... All of that together points to this kind of fourfold framework that uh, Cyprian sees in Ezekiel 36, that uh, the Old Testament promises to the nations are fulfilled in the conversion of people into the New Testament church. Now, that's also on down the line, like a universally how the early Christians understood what was going on in baptism. Nobody said baptism was just a symbol. Nobody thought baptism was just a symbol. You, you see them talking about the waters of rebirth, the washing of rebirth in the context of baptism over and over again. So uh, to the short answer <laughs> at the very end of a long digression is that many modern Protestants who call themselves born again Christians say that they are such because they've made a personal commitment to Jesus. And that would have been just bizarre to early Christians. When they spoke of being born again, they only and ever meant the washing of rebirth and baptism. Yeah. And that's very interesting because, you know, they might say, well, you know, I love the quote by Irenaeus. It's a great quote, which he has talks about uh, baptism and regeneration. I mean, they all are, but um, they, someone could say, well, Irenaeus isn't, you know, the Bible. I go by the Bible coming back to this. But the reality is if Irenaeus, you know, was wrong, he could be wrong because he's not infallible. But here's the thing. Well, what, I like what you're saying. And you quote so many people in the book. Every single person believed this in the early church. It wasn't just Irenaeus. So everyone would have had to get the Holy Spirit dead wrong, completely backwards. And uh, the reality is they all agree. So maybe the modern churches today that have departed from original Christianity are the ones who are wrong. And I think that's something that people might want to consider. Yeah, he does a good job. Uh, speaking of Old Testament kind of exegesis, he looks at Naaman the Syrian in 2 Kings 5. If you don't remember, Naaman is a, a Gentile and a leper. And um, at the word of Elisha, he goes and is washed seven times and his skin becomes clean. And Irenaeus sees in that uh, the prefigurement of how the Gentiles are made clean from all of their the, the leprosy of sin through baptism. And so, yeah, you're right. It's like, what do you make of that? Like, if you're someone who doesn't take that baptismal theology, do you just think like the apostles didn't teach about baptism? Because here's the thing. <laughs> St. Paul speaks of baptism as a basic doctrine. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Like he has it on the list of like the basic things everybody knows. And so like I genuinely don't understand how you can believe that at the end of the apostolic age or during the apostolic age, that everybody understands baptism and say <laughs> for 500 years, Every extra biblical reference to baptism is consistent with the Catholic view, and they're not consistent with the Protestant view. Well, are you just saying everybody got it and then nobody got it? What, like, what's the scenario? What's the <laughs> like, it, it, it's inscrutable. Like, and I haven't, I've read Protestant scholars who just say, well, I think they're wrong. Okay, well, tell me this. Like, how did, how could they possibly be wrong, All given that them. they're getting this? Yeah, that they're getting this from apostles, and the apostles are like, good, you get baptism. And we're saying, no, you actually didn't. <laughs> like what? Like, it just doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Yeah. So at the end of the apostolic age, everybody understood what the apostles were teaching. Then on a dime, everyone just stopped knowing. Yeah, just, what the, <laughs> like a, the men in black, like memory forgetting device. Like, yeah, right. Like, exactly. They, they just forgot that one doctrine and what, what the apostles actually taught. Um, yeah, and that could be said for the Eucharist and other things as well. So let's talk about the Eucharist because, you know, this is a little bit of a, uh, you know, controversial one because the the 
boundaries keep changing. Their arguments keep changing from the Protestant side. You know, they used to just say, you know, as you know, symbol versus literal, that sort of thing. But now you have people saying, no, there's actually four different understandings in the early church and spiritual, literal, symbolic, you know, different things. So, you know, nobody, you know, truly agreed in the early church. But in your book, you say, no, they all agreed that the Eucharist was the true presence of the Eucharist. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the Eucharist is literal, spiritual, and symbolic. Like it is all of those things. So (laughs) depending on the context, you may preach on one of those things like the spiritual transformation of the Eucharist or the literal presence of Christ in the Eucharist, you know, that the Eucharist is literally Jesus. Or you can talk about how the Eucharist points towards the humanity of Christ in heaven. You know, like all of those things are true. All those things coexist. And as a Catholic, you would affirm all of those things properly understood. So it's a false debate. And one of the signs of the false debate is nobody's debating. You know, the, the Protestant read of the church fathers now that you're referring to, it used to be that people would just say, oh, well, the early Christians didn't believe in the real presence or the early Christians didn't believe the Eucharist was Jesus. But then you read them and you're just like, oh, yeah, they do. <laughs> uh, but then some of them focus more on these spiritual or symbolic dimensions of the Eucharist. And so now the argument is, as you said, that maybe there are two camps or maybe there are four camps. And the obvious question is, OK, if there are different camps with different theologies about something as important as the Eucharist, Show me one place where they debate. Show me one place where they argue. I was just reading yesterday the uh, controversy about the dating of Easter that leads to Pope Victor trying to excommunicate all the bishops in Turkey. And then St. Irenaeus kind of talks him down and he undoes it. They, the day on which we're going to celebrate Easter was a big enough issue to excommunicate people, but being heretical on the Eucharist wasn't. Like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, like, where are the excommunications on this? And the first time we see them is like the 10th century, Uh, you know, um, the whole controversy with Berengarius of Tours, you know, like it's way later. It's a millennium later, basically, that that we have these kind of Eucharistic controversies that uh, it really was quite clear on, on three scores. First. The early Christians believed the Eucharist was Jesus. That when we, like when we talk about real presence, you'll occasionally have Protestants say, "Well, I believe Jesus is really present, like in some vague spiritual way, or like in with and under the elements." But that, they believe something richer and more substantial. Uh, two, they believe the Mass really was the Eucharistic sacrifice. That there is a true sacrifice, the sacrifice of Calvary taking place. And three, that as a result, those who didn't have that belief couldn't come forward to communion. And in fact, Ignatius is going to say, have nothing to do with it. Like if, if they don't confess the Eucharist to be the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, just avoid them. Uh, So for all of those reasons. For the record, just to clarify, um, just in case Protestants are watching this, yes, they believed it was a real sacrifice, but unlike some anti-Catholics, we don't actually sacrifice Jesus over and over and over again. Um, maybe you could ex- just make yeah, yeah, I would be happy to. So this is a difference between how first century people understood sacrifice and how people today do. Because look, like I'm going to venture that none of your listeners or none of your viewers on YouTube uh, have ever been part of like an animal sacrifice religion. But the early Christians, whether they were Gentiles or Jews, that was their background. And so they understood food sacrifices in a way that we don't today. Food sacrifice has a couple parts to it. Uh, we'll take the Passover one because it's the easiest. The, the first stage is you kill the animal. The second stage is you eat the animal. Those are two distinct actions in one sacrificial ritual. And they happen on different days. You kill the animal on preparation day. You eat the animal on the first day of unleavened bread on, on Passover. When you eat the lamb, you are engaged in the sacrifice, but not engaged in it by killing the lamb again. The lamb has already been killed. This is the unbloody dimension to the sacrifice. The bloody dimension was killing the lamb uh, the, you know, the prior day. We would say earlier in the day, but it's the difference of calendars. Uh, so in that sense, like, what is preparation day prefigure? Well, it prefigures the bloody sacrifice on Calvary on Good Friday. What does the Passover meal prefigure? Well, it prefigures Holy Thursday. It prefigures every Mass. Um, Passover, the meal was a sacrificial liturgy. And like, and so anyone who doesn't get that part is just missing this. In 1 Corinthians 10, uh, St. Paul has this fascinating comparison where he compares the Christian Eucharistic sacrifice to pagan ritual sacrifices and to Jewish temple sacrifices. 
and compares what happens at the table of the Lord, meaning the Christian altar, with the table of demons, the pagan altar. Like all of that stuff, like we use your table and imagine like Thanksgiving or something, you know, everybody's gathered around and they're grateful. That's not, there's something much richer, much more sacrificial uh, going on to Jewish and Gentile listeners who, who were much more versed in the way sacrifices work than, than we are today. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, you're going back to uh, the earliest Christians. You were talking about the Eucharist and different ways to understand it and stuff. And, you know, it's very interesting that as soon as Luther, you know, broke away from the Catholic church, they they disagreed on the Eucharist and they were fierce about it. It was one of the only doctrines that kept them from creating a Protestant creed and uniting under one banner. And um, they were fierce in their divisions. They were saying, no, this is what the Bible says. Zwingli would say, no, you're absolutely a moron. This is what the Bible says. <laughs> you know, so like they wanted truth. And I think for our listeners, if anyone hasn't read the earliest Christians, here's what you need to know. They were equally or more fierce when somebody changed the slightest teaching of Jesus, if someone taught something that was not handed on from the apostles, they jumped on it. So if someone says like Tertullian, people say Tertullian taught, you know, a different type of a Eucharist, but he didn't. First of all, he was a Catholic and he taught the Bishop of Rome and taught all Catholic things that Protestants would not want to subscribe to. But second of all, even if he did teach something different, everyone would have jumped on it. But as Joe, as you said, Joe, rightly, that nobody argued with him because they understood that he was not teaching something different. People are reading back into the fathers what I feel, what they want to read into them. Yeah, I think that's, that's well said. And I think it's it's worth pointing out, as you said, I mean, um, oh, who was it? Alistair McGrath has a history of the Reformation where he, he looks at this uh, a kind of instance in which Luther and Zwingli seem like they're so close to uniting to have just a Protestant church to rival the Catholic church, but they can't agree on, on Eucharistic theology. And then Calvin agrees with neither of them. And, and so it's like, okay, great. We find concrete evidence of Protestants fighting Protestants on the Eucharist. And rightly so, if it's as important a doctrine as everybody seems to agree that it is. Well, if the early Christians believe the things they're saying about the Eucharist, and someone comes along and says, oh, no, none of that's true. Well, just take like the example I alluded to before of Ignatius's letter to the Smyrnians, uh, chapter seven, in which he just says, have nothing to do with heretics who deny that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Jesus. Okay, well, that's, that's a really good signal that if there were Christians in the fold saying the Eucharist is just a symbol, the other Christians would excommunicate. We're told that we, you know, we're told this is the appropriate way. How can you be in communion with someone who denies communion? How can you be in communion with someone who denies the Eucharistic communion? You just can't. Uh, and so it would have led to excommunications. It would have led to infighting. We've seen nothing of that. On the other hand, if you want to see controversies about like Jerome versus Rufinus on the translation of Origen or Jerome versus Augustine on like uh, which Latin versions to be read of the scripture, you know, like you can find plenty of seemingly more superficial debates. A lot of them involving Jerome later on, but like you know, you'll find you'll find Christians actually opposing one another. Uh, it's not that they just had this live and let live, you do you kind of attitude. Anyone who's right. ever read the Church Fathers knows that's not true. They write books like Against Heresies, right? Like, you know, <laughs> you don't have a book called Against Heresies if you're just like everybody believe whatever you want, right? Uh, and so, if Eucharistic heresies aren't making the cut, what in the world's going? Like, in other words, this is another one of those areas where. If you're just reading the text, you can understand it in a number of ways. The minute you stop and say, okay, let me put this in context. If my reading in this Protestant way is true, what would I expect to find? You find none of that. That's a pretty good sign that you're, you're reading this wrong. Could you just give us a couple early um, Christians on the Eucharist, uh, you know, what they said, and just so we can hear it, you know, people might be saying, oh, well, this is what you say, you know, and, and I just will point out, you know, your book is great. The early church was the Catholic Church you can get at Catholic Answers Press. Um, but, you know, you have quotes in here, but could you just give us for the sake of, you know, what we're saying to substantiate it? Yeah. So um, I'll give you a couple. Irenaeus, I, I mentioned Ignatius before. I'll, I'll count that as having shared that. Uh, Irenaeus, a little later, says of the Gnostics, vain in every respect are they who despise the entire dispensation of God and disallow the flesh and treat with contempt its regeneration. 
maintaining that it is not capable of incorruption. Now, notice what the controversy is about here. The Gnostics hate the flesh. They hate the body. They deny the incarnation. They deny anything bodily because they think the body is inherently evil. And you might expect Irenaeus to focus on that. But he says, if you believe that, you can't have the real presence, right? So he says, but if this indeed does not attain salvation, then neither did the Lord redeem us with his blood, nor is the cup of the Eucharist the communion of his blood, nor the bread which we break the communion of his body. For blood can only come from veins and flesh, and whatsoever else makes up the substance of man, such as the word of God was actually made. In other words, his whole argument is you can't believe in a corporeal real presence because you deny the incarnation, because you deny the goodness of the body. Well, that argument doesn't make sense if Irenaeus holds to like a spiritual communion kind of view, because the Gnostics could easily affirm Christ is with us spiritually in the in the Eucharist. That's what they believe, that Christ is only with us spiritually. He was not really bodily with us. So the, you know, the Protestant view would be fine from Gnostic perspective, but the Christian view held by the early church wasn't fine. Like, we, we find them saying, look, you can't affirm the real presence because you don't and you don't believe that Jesus really has a body and really has blood. Uh, and again, that, the, the argument only makes sense. Um, we can also find, you know, Justin Martyr. He says, not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ, our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise, we've been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. So the Eucharist simply is the flesh and blood of Christ. And uh, he also speaks of the sacrificial nature. And he points out that this is mocked by the Mithraic uh, sacrifices, that they have these kind of demonic parodies of the mm-hmm. Eucharistic sacrifice. And so you can see the, the whole notion of the Eucharist is Jesus. And we, we barely even touched on the sacrificial side, but I think that's a really huge side and really points to this. And one of the, you know, when we talk about real presence, as I said before, you'll find some Protestants who they don't take a simply symbolic view. They have more of a muddled view somewhere in the middle and they can say, oh, this all seems very technical. But on, on one particular issue, it should be very clear. Uh, on the issue, is this, like, is the mass the sacrifice or not? Uh, and on that issue, all of the Christians are on one side of the early church, and then the reformers are all on the other side. And Martin Luther, of all people, highlights this fact. He says, there is no belief in the church more generally received or more firmly held than that the mass is a good work and a sacrifice. Uh, John Calvin said that Satan had... Uh, not only obscured and perverted, but altogether obliterated and abolished the Lord's Supper by blinding almost the whole world into the belief that the Mass was a sacrifice and oblation for obtaining the remission of sins. Both Luther and Calvin point out that this view that the Mass is a Eucharistic sacrifice is taught by the theologians and by the laity throughout all of the ages and by the texts of the Mass themselves. Now, that's a really good rejoinder to the earlier question about the idea that the early Christians may have been Protestants. Like, no, no, the mass they're celebrating was incompatible with Protestantism, according to the reformers. That, you know, in calling Christ the victim at the altar, in saying this is what was prefigured by the sacrifice of Abel, uh, you know, on and on and on. And so I, I look at that, you just can't, you can't believe what the early Christians believed about the sacrifice of the mass and believe any mainstream Protestant theology, Lutheran, Calvinist, Baptist, whatever you, whatever you want to go with. <laughs> excellent points. Uh, excellent. And uh, it reminds me of Mormonism, you know, just a couple hundred years later, everyone got it wrong after the apostles until us. <laughs> yeah, well, e- even before a couple hundred years later, I mentioned the Didache. The Didache talks about the sacrifice. <laughs> Uh, and it, it refers to Malachi chapter one. Again, some Old Testament exegesis. In Malachi one, uh, God says to the Jewish leaders, I have no pleasure in you. I will not accept an offering from your hand. But from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. And in every place, incense is offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and the food for it may be despised. Again, notice. 
that the offering, the sacrificial offering, is offered at the Lord's table. The table is an altar. It's not just like a gathering place. And there's this promise that there will be a rejection of the Jewish sacrifices in favor of ones offered even by Gentiles, a worldwide offering. Now, the Didache and several other first and second century church fathers point to this as prophesying uh, the Eucharist, that with the Mass, Gentiles are able to offer a pure and pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. And that only makes sense if the Mass is a sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Um, and when I said uh, a couple of centuries later, I was talking about Mormons came after Calvin oh. a couple of centuries. No, <laughs> no, just to be clear. Um, so very good point. And just in case that, you know, people... Uh, want this book, you can get it at Catholic Answers Press. The early church was the Catholic church. And we're showing that, in fact, the early church was the Catholic church. It didn't develop later, the Catholic church, or wasn't invented later. The earliest, earliest Christians we know of were Catholic. And people say that the Catholic church, you know, once it became the Catholic church with Constantine, it was corrupt. It was evil. It's satanic. It's the horror of Babylon. And yet it was this, this satanic, corrupt, most evil whore that made the Bible and shows the canon of scripture somehow, you know, and you talk about this in your book about where the Bible came from. How did we get the Bible? Can you, you know, talk briefly about this? Just because a lot of people don't know. I talk to Protestant pastors all the time and they have no idea where the Bible came from. Yeah, so I, I look specifically at the gospel. I look specifically at, again, as I, I mentioned kind of earlier in the show, uh, how do we know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the real deal and the gospel of Thomas isn't or fill in the blank? And we know that from second century Christians. In fact, um, the first person to tell us Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John explicitly is St. Irenaeus, who we just were talking about. Uh, before him, um, you have a partial reference, but because we just have a fragment, we only know two of the four Gospels that uh, I believe it's Hippolytus uh, includes, or no, Hegesippus, excuse me, Hegesippus in like 160. Um, so you, you have this kind of like partial information. You also have occasionally quotations, but you'll you'll see the, the earliest disciples uh, didn't always quote the New Testament directly. They would paraphrase it pretty heavily. So it's not always clear like which things are quotations and which things are just things they may have heard over and over again from the apostles. And, and so it's actually pretty hard to reconstruct the New Testament from the earliest quotations. Uh, but we know they were conversant in what the apostles taught and what, what the early Christians taught was consistent with what later emerged as the canon of the New Testament. But in the earliest days, it is it is a little tricky. So all of that's to say, um, there are four tests that I look at in the book. Apostolicity, you know, the idea that a book has to be written by an apostle or an companion of the apostles. Orthodoxy, that it has to square with what was taught by the apostles. We know that through sacred tradition. Uh, liturgical use, you know, were these books accepted in the mass and the early church? And, and fourth, uh, acceptance of the apostolic fathers. Do the great theologians of the church, do the great pastors and leaders treat these as reliable, authentic books or not? And by those four standards, which are standards that are more or less used by the early Christians themselves, we can say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John make the cut. No other books do. But notice that none of those four questions can be answered without taking a hard look at these second century Christians and trusting what they tell us. Because we have no direct evidence apart from them that these books were written by the apostles or that they were uh, in keeping with sacred tradition, or that they were, you know, in use in the liturgy, or that they were accepted by the church fathers. Like, the only way we know any of these things is through the church fathers themselves. So the Protestant who, you know, maybe they make it that far through the book and say, well, I guess I just give up on these second century Christians. They're a bunch of heretics. Then hopefully realizes they're in a bit of trouble. And so I, I close that part by looking at what I think is a really interesting uh kind of maybe tension, maybe hypocrisy, one might say, uh, about what to make of the early Christians. And so I, I look at uh, D.A. Carson or Don Carson Gospel Coalition has a pretty uh, widely used commentary on the Apostle of John. Now, actually, a lot of the, the commentary is pretty good. But when he looks at authorship of John, well, how do we know that John wrote John? He points to Irenaeus and he says, well, even if Irenaeus toward the end of the second century is among the strongest, totally unambiguous witnesses, his personal connection with Polycarp, who knew John, means the distance in terms of personal memories is not very great. So he's making an argument. Like, yeah, sure. Irenaeus, the first guy who tells us about the authorship of the Gospel of John, is 180. 
but the Apostle John knew Polycarp, who knew Irenaeus. So it's not a, a real intellectual leap to think he's got this information correct. That's a good argument. I, I agree with him there. But then he's going to attack, when he gets to his commentary on John 6, Ignatius of Antioch's understanding, because Ignatius of Antioch calls the Eucharist the medicine of immortality, the idea which prevents us from dying. He clearly has a, a view of the real presence as <clears throat> totally inconsistent with what a Protestant like Carson is going to believe. And uh, instead, now Carson says, well, anyone who's followed theological developments in the 20th century, let alone the 16th or the 1st, does not need convincing that major changes can be introduced in the space of 20 years even by disciples of a revered leader. So in other words, it doesn't matter that Ignatius got his understanding of John directly from John, <laughs> that Ignatius understood John 6 because he was uh, like a student of the Apostle John. Well, nevertheless, you know, maybe that was too long of a time. Again, Ignatius is writing <laughs> like 107. He's actually like seven years after the death of John writing these things after having studied under him. And yet Carson is saying, oh, maybe that's too long of a time. But that's fine to go to 180 to accept the authorship. Like it doesn't make any, like if we can't right. trust a student of a student of John to know what John's about, or excuse me, if we can't trust a student of John to know what, what John's about, why can't we trust a student of a student of John? Like it, it, Carson's whole principle just totally falls apart. And I would argue it's, it's seemingly pretty hypocritical. There's a, a blatant double standard. Irenaeus can be correct because he agrees with me. But <laughs> exactly. Ignatius of Antioch, well, he disagrees with me. He he probably got it wrong. No, yeah. And that's a little intellectually dishonest if you don't mind me just jumping in thinking off the top of my head, because he's basing it off what he believes rather than what they're keeping to the same standard and what they're actually saying, and that no one disagreed with Ignatius, that everyone agreed with Ignatius on this. Yeah, he's not doing scholarship. He's just imposing his own theology. He's not saying we can trust the students of disciples or we can't. And, and I would, I'm fine. I'm actually fine with the idea, you know, a student of Polycarp's could get things wrong. And in fact, we know of one, Florinus, who is a student of Polycarp's who defected from the faith and became a Gnostic. But we also know what happens. Irenaeus writes a letter to him and calls him out. And, and the nub of the letter is, Polycarp didn't teach this stuff. Where are you getting this? <laughs> like, you know, this isn't what we learned. We both were students of Polycarp's. We both heard him preach. And he knew what the Apostle John taught, and, and it was none of this crazy Gnostic stuff. So it's it's not even just anything a student says is reliable. It really is a little more nuanced, a little more robust. If the student is going wrong, if they're introducing some crazy heresy, he mentions the 16th century and the 20th century. And look, when you have those crazy digressions or theology suddenly goes nuts in a certain place, you also find people writing about that and pointing it out like, hey, this... This person doesn't believe what the person before them believed. They, they believe something crazy and, and different, and we're not aware of that. We're not used to that. Uh, and so it, it is pretty shocking because Carson's argument really doesn't work on its own terms. If you're going to make the comparison to the 16th century and the 20th century, we've got plenty of evidence of theological controversies from those two eras. We have no evidence of people disagreeing with Ignatius's Eucharistic theology. Exactly. And we have plenty of uh, people disagreeing on even the Bible canon. You know, or like mm -hmm. what books should be considered scripture. But it's very interesting that it was the Catholic Church basing the tr on the tradition that the apostles had handed on that ended up canonizing the Bible and putting which certain books. I mean, there were way more than four gospels written, but only four were chosen because those are the ones that could be authenticated um, and no one held to the traditions. Yeah, a lot of the other ones are just too late. They're not reliably from apostles. And, and so the church is not just gullibly receiving everything somebody claims. Uh, there is a, a much more rigorous process. And I think that the story of that process points to the reliability and the orthodoxy of the church in the second century, that we can trust the things this church is saying, and this church is saying some very Catholic things. <laughs> yeah, very well said. Um, did you have any closing thoughts um, you know, before we finish up here? Um, I, I'd only say, in addition to what I just said, I, I guess I'd say I hope this book sparks more of an interest in the Church Fathers among Catholic and non-Catholic readers alike, uh, because they're, they're such a tremendous gift that they really are enriching where you read this and think, oh, wow, I'd never made that connection. You know, I'd never looked at Jesus's conversation with the Samaritan woman as being a reference to the Eucharist. 
if you don't know why that would be the case, then read the book and you'll see your NAS making that connection. You know, all of those things, right? It really opens up a whole world. Even if you're someone who believes everything the church believes already, you may be really struck by the beautiful way in which they unpack the Old and New Testament in ways that we're often not really exposed to today. Yeah. Yeah. And to add to that, I would just say, you know, when I read the early church fathers, it's not like, you know, we are trying to use them as a hammer against Protestants and saying, you're all wrong. You're evil. Look, at look what they teach. That proves you're wrong. No, we're just saying, you know, that the, there's a continuity of belief going all the way back to the time of the apostles. And it's a beautiful thing. And if, more than that, if you read the writings of the earliest Christians, as you just said, sometimes they get three, four, five, six layers of meaning of interpretation out of a single passage. And you're like mind blown. And it's like, they could just, it's, it's amazing how they weave the old Testament and the new Testament together prophecies and fulfillments. And it's just unbelievable. So if, I, I would even, ch- you know, if you want to start somewhere, you know, def- you could start here. Um, you know, Jimmy Aiken also has a book. We, there's a three volume set that we have here on our shelf. You can see the uh, red, blue, and green ones. It's called the faith of the early church. If you just want a more, you know, just their writings and you want to see what they have to say for themselves, or you can find them online, but they're all over the place. And I would encourage people to read what the earliest Christians don't be afraid of them, you know, go wherever truth leads. Jesus says, sometimes we have to pick up our cross and follow him. And sometimes that means following the hard truth. And so, uh, Joe, I want to thank you for uh, writing this book. Uh, Once again, it's the early church was the Catholic church by Catholic answers press. And um, it's talking about the earliest Christians and how they were in fact Catholic. So I want to thank you for writing it. And I want to thank you for sharing it on our podcast today. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm very happy to do so. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure to have you. I think everything you said was you know, very well said, very well presented. And I want to thank uh, all of our listeners, our followers for watching today. And if you haven't yet, I will put link this down below uh, in our show notes. You can check that out and follow us on social media below. If you haven't already, why not? Why haven't you followed our Instagram and TikTok and Facebook? Do it. And if you would like to um, bring in Joe, um, you can check out Catholic.com. He's a speaker and author and uh, you can book him. Or if you would like to bring us in as well, you can check out our website. Thank you all for watching. Please continue praying for our ministry and supporting our ministry as we are always praying for you. God bless you all. 